Hey everyone, I'm Matt Burns and this is TechCrunch Live, where founders help founders build better venture-backed businesses. Today, we're talking about one of the most vital industries, trucking. And we have a great pair of speakers to talk about bringing modern fintech tools to the trucking industry. Joining us today is Eric Terzinski of Contrary Capital and Hershita Aurora from A to B. This is a tough time to raise funds in most sectors, and many VCs will tell you you have to have a killer product market fit before getting a check. But Eric actually believes in investing in people over businesses. And the wisdom to this approach has been proven out with A to B. The company actually started out as what was basically Uber for buses. But due to the strength of the founding team, they were able to quickly pivot and turn into more like Stripe for transportation. That is an integrated financial platform based on a fuel card for truckers. Since founding in September 2019, the company has scaled to a network of 25,000 businesses and 100,000 truck drivers in the U.S. And here's what I know about trucking. Nothing. So I'm thrilled to have Rebecca Bell in here. She's our fantastic transportation reporter at TechCrunch, and she's simply the best. She's, she's great. You're going to love her. If you've been here before, you know the drill. But if not... You need to watch a show on Hop In. There should be a link on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter right now. Click that link, jump through the couple hoops, and join us on Hop In, where you can ask questions to the speakers and participate in pitch practice. So do that right now. And with that, that's all I have to go. That's all I have to say. So, Rebecca, the uh, the show is yours. Thanks, Matt. Hi, Harshita. Hi, Eric. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, I'm really interested in this idea of investing in people over businesses, because it's not the first time I've heard it as a, quite a few VCs have, have said this to me before. So, um, you know, Eric, if you could just kind of roll us in, tell us about your first meeting with the founders. What was it about them that convinced you to invest? Yeah. So I, I think, uh, I think a lot of VCs talk about this often, right? Uh, it's, it's kind of, you know, we invest in people, but I think when you, when you really look at it, um, you know, for the most part, uh, venture is very transactional, right? You kind of wait for the founder to put their hand up in the air and say, I'm fundraising. And then it kind of devolves into this, you know, very transactional deal, right? Where you're trying to win the deal and, and then you move on, right? And I think, you know, kind of when we started Contrary, the, the whole notion was, well, what if you could just go one notch earlier than that, right? What if you could actually focus on, on kind of identifying the person before the idea in many ways and get to know them, build kind of a deep, authentic relationship with that person uh, first, and, and, and then kind of help them however you can and write that first check, you know, uh, when, they're, when they're starting their, their company invariably. And so uh, the genesis kind of in terms of how this came with, with A to B specifically was, um, so I met uh, Harshita's co-founder Tushar almost five years ago now. So kind of in the very, very early days of uh, of, of contrary. And he was one of Uber India's first employees. Um, and so uh, he had kind of left that, moved to San Francisco, uh, and was starting uh, like a micro mobility kind of logistics company at the time, um, which we invested in. Um, and ultimately, kind of you fast forward, uh, the company ended up not working out. But, you know, we said to Tushar, look, you know, uh, We've tracked you over the past year or two. We think you're exceptional. Uh, you know, we, we, we kind of uh, want to do and want to back whatever you do next, right? So just keep us posted. And so, you know, the company Grito ultimately didn't pan out, but then through that, you know, ended up meeting uh, Harshita, Vignan, Tushar, when they kind of swung back around uh, to learn about A to B and what they were doing at the time. And, and yeah, I mean, kind of per what we said, we, we met the team when they're still working on the original idea, but said, look, you know, we, we, we don't care what it is, right? We don't care whether it's, you know, Uber for buses or, or, or Stripe for, for trucking. Uh, we think that the three of you are exceptional people. So we want to write a check and, uh, and, and move on. And kind of the rest is, is history. And we've been a close partner since. So that's the, the quick, quick background. Hmm. Cool. Yeah. And before we get into Harshida's uh, founding story, I, I'm curious, what are some red flags? You, you obviously could tell that the team was working really well together. Um, I guess that's just something you kind of intuit while you're talking to them. You see how, you know, you, you check their background, you see how they interact with one another um, and with you. But I'm wondering, what are some red flags that VCs might see within a team that you're like, eh, I just don't, I think you guys, there might be drama. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think, um, there, there are a couple of things. I think number one, um, within a team specifically, 
you have to reference really aggressively if, if you're a venture investor, right? So, uh, and reference every person individually, right? Um, and understand, hey, you know, what are their peers, colleagues, uh, uh, you know, former managers, like how do they how do they kind of feel about each of these people in a silo, right? Um, are they kind of high character people, strong work ethics, um, you know, whatever it might be. And, and that's kind of on an isolated basis. And that usually helps you build a picture of, you know, each of the founders kind of on an individual level, right? Um, and then kind of combining everybody together, right? It's, it's, it's all about, um, uh, you know, kind of, I'd say like how well, how well they gel together and their clarity of thought for what they're pursuing, right? I think sometimes we find founders that have, um, I think, kind of really overlapping skill sets, Right. So you have two people that maybe have more of a skill set of being a, a CEO type or, uh, you know, they start to kind of encroach on one another's turf. Right. Whereas I think, you know, the best some of the best founding teams have very kind of complementary skill sets where you're running in parallel on two or three different pieces of the business with maybe slight overlap and enough context to be able to push back, understand, give feedback um, and, and kind of like, you know, be a co-founder, but not you know, overstepping your bounds. Um, so I, I think kind of like those are a couple of things that, uh, you know, that we see. Maybe the last one that's always a red flag is uh, <laughs> when we talk to some founding teams at times when we're looking at things at the seed stage, uh, the founders will constantly talk over one another. Um, and I think that's kind of a dead giveaway as well, that this is clearly a, a, a group of people that don't have the trust yet in one another. Right. So they always feel the need to kind of add on top of something that somebody else is saying, add extra context. When really, again, if, if I think if you're kind of fully on the same page with one another, you have that deep inherent trust in, in what the other person is saying or communicating. So those are just a couple of thoughts. But hmm. yeah. And, and Harshita, what where did you meet your co founders? Yeah. So Vignette and I uh, originally met actually through the internet. Um, uh, I think uh, you know he had emailed after reading uh, an article about me, and you know uh, I, I thought his background was interesting. So I think about four years ago now, um, we originally met just to like talk about self-driving cars because he was working at Cruise Automation at the time, and I was like interested in transportation and you know engineering and things like that. Uh, and was following uh, that space. Um, so we connected uh, originally just, uh, you know, as friends and, uh, you know, met frequently just to talk about uh, interesting ideas, Not never thinking that, you know, we, we would start a company uh, right away. But, you know, almost like, I think, eight or nine months later, you know, he was thinking about uh, leaving cruise automation. Uh, and I, I had been thinking about, you know, starting another company. And so that's when we decided, let's try this together. And then, um, later on, uh, Tushar actually also was like cold reach out. Uh, we were trying to find a strong ops uh, uh, focused partner. And um, I think it was one of our like early angel investors who had posted in, in, in their network and Tushar reached out, we spoke to him. And um, after a few conversations, we knew, you know, this is a great fit. Um, so as, as uh, Matt also originally started uh, in, in the, uh, at the start of the interview that we were working on this Uber for buses idea and then Went uh, went through the pivot process uh, together. So yeah, I think it was it is the you know sort of the magic of the internet uh, is, uh, is is how we all met. Yeah, well, how did you know that the chemistry would work? Like, what what were some good signs? What is like each of you kind of really good at? If you could give yourself you know a personality sector, you know maybe one's more of a thinker and a tinkerer, and one's more of a you know hands on doer. I don't know. Yeah, that's a good question. So I think. Uh, it's been a couple of years, so I've had, I guess, a lot of data. I think um, uh, Char is really good at understanding um, uh, how to build strong ops processes and get very deep into data um, uh, to understand sort of what is broken in in, in something, right? And 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 really uh, take ownership of fixing it fast. You know, as an example, in Q4, Char took over like our risk team and uh, really got us uh, from. Um, you know, uh, contribution negative, uh, highly negative, actually, to being profitable, which is like a, a big thing for the company uh, and sort of, I would say, uh, uh, very critical for survival uh, for us. So I think uh, that uh, really attests to his skill in um, in in like 
uh, uh, being very uh, data driven and understanding like um, problems super deeply. Um, I think I am more of like a product and engineering focused uh, uh, person. I really like uh, thinking about how can we build a better product to uh, and and for what customer segment uh, should we do that? And then I really enjoy working with the teams um, to get there. Um, and then Vignan, who's like the CEO, he um, sort of has uh, like you know skills on both sides, um, but really strong at um, you know thinking about the long term um, and what what should be our vision, what should be the next uh, thing we build, and uh, uh, what is uh, you know how do we unlock more of the TAM and and uh, expand the the growth opportunity, and then bringing on those partners, whether it is um, say marketplace partnerships and uh, or it is like you know new um, uh, merchants and so forth, like unlocking more TAM essentially, and then, um, you know, going through the, the execution process on it. So I think we, we each, uh, as, as Eric said, like complementary skills always help. Um, so I think that it works out quite well. And, um, uh, and, you know, we've been, I think, quite productive last couple of years. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, I think this is why it works, right? Because right, like, just like she said, right? It's like Tushar is kind of the operations, you know, Harshita is the engineering and and product and and Vignan is, is kind of the sales leadership vision, right? So it is, I think, like all the traits of a, of a great team there. So, yeah. 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 So, I mean, just dialing it back a little bit, Harshita's story is really cool. I'm not sure if people who are watching um, know about this much. But um, Harshita, please correct me if I'm wrong, but you dropped out of school at 14 um, because you were just like, this is basic and I'm too smart for this is my words, not yours. But <laughs> you were like, uh, I actually can teach myself better things. Like I, I know computer science, I'm just going to like be a sponge and soak it all up. Two years later at 16, you built a crypto tracking iOS app that absolutely dominated, got um you know, purchased by Redwood City Ventures, right? It got acquired by them. And then and then now you're 21. You're 21 years old. I feel really far behind. I was backpacking at 21. Um, so how, you know, we talk a lot in the VC world or we have over the past couple of decades about the boy genius, like, oh, like a smart MIT boy in a hoodie and, you know, brilliant ideas. Let's give him a whole chunk of money. What about the girl genius, right? So Eric, how is the VC world reacting to a true, you know, female force? Yeah. I mean, look, I, I think you said it yourself, like, she is <laughs> clearly special. Uh, and, 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 and I, and I think like, I think the venture world is hungry for things like this, like you were saying, right? Uh, I think hungry for everybody's, everybody has the, you know, like you said, the 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 Drew Halstons or Carlsons or people who have, you know, dropped out of, of MIT, right? Um, but I think Harshita's story is, is, is like that much more unique, incredible, special. And so I, we, we were talking about this, the three of us before we went live here, right? But I think there's, uh, I think this is one of the, the really special parts of the Valley in particular over the past five, 10 years, right. Is, is this willingness to, uh, you know, kind of have people like her, should be discovered. Right. Uh, and, and then, you know, as long as you have an interesting idea and you're a really sharp, ambitious person, I think increasingly it doesn't matter where you're from, what your background is, you know, you name it, right. You too, I think, uh, uh, can, can, you know, get capital and, and have a crack at building really special and, and kind of enduring business. So, yeah, I think people are hungry for it. I think her, she's just kind of the tip of the iceberg. So. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I think that, you're probably right that people are are getting hungry for it, and you know, contrary seems to be, um, in, at least in this instance, really uh, open to that. I have talked to other founders. There's another founder here in New Zealand, actually, that I spoke to. I live in New Zealand, by the way. Um, that her name's Fia Jones. She's the founder of Asterix um, Astronautics, uh, and she, I think, yeah, she's got a cool founding story as well. But she, you know, I asked her, you know, as a young woman of color, how have you felt? Um, it, you know, getting money in the space. And she felt that sometimes people didn't always take her seriously uh, and that they took her more seriously when she let her male co-founder speak. Harshad, have you had similar experiences? In uh, Into like investors? Yeah, talking to investors. Yeah, I mean... Or do you feel like you're just like, I'm so brilliant that people have to see that? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think I have a ton of data on that because, um, uh, you know... 
Uh, you my co-founder, being that has been part of the funders process largely. It's a lot of work, as as, as you might know, and ends up uh, taking up, becoming the top of mind. You know, I think PG, for example, has an essay also on it. If you're fundraising, you can't do anything else. Um, so for Series A and Series B, it was my co-founder. Um, and I, I remember during seed conversations going into these meetings and, um, you know, talking to investors and, um, and I think, uh, I, I couldn't directly tell if they're, they're like, you know, me joining these meetings is necessarily not helping. I mean, I would talk and also this is again, like Buss's idea. Um, so we were, we would talk about the problem and, you know, the traction we had at that time. Um, and yeah, I, 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 I don't really have a ton of data, and um, uh, ultimately, like I thought in that process, you know, at the, at our seed round was led by, you know, Bloomberg, Bloomberg Beta, um, and you know, in that entire process, you know, um, I felt like I, you know, I, I got to talk about the problem and uh, and our backgrounds, um, so didn't notice a significant difference. But I wasn't actively sort of trying to collect that data. I think, uh, but I have heard about this broadly uh, as a as a problem that even unfortunately venture capitalists have to tell their founders that they should have go and have the like uh you know male co-founder go talk to investors just because it's more uh more likely to convert that way but uh i have personally not noticed. that's correct well i'm good to i'm glad to hear that but like you know so let's take up the let's talk about the data that you do have um so if we can shift gears <laughs> to talking about trucking um you know, I cover a lot of trucking, uh, a lot of the trucking industry. One of the things that we talk about is the trucker shortage, right? So we've been hearing a lot about the trucker shortage. You know, it's not a great job um, for a lot of people, especially long haul. Uh, and some startups answer to that is to automate trucking, uh, and which I've covered quite a bit. So I'm curious, um, Harshita, what are some of the pain points that you've found in your hundreds of interviews with truckers? And how does your product specifically address those yeah i think uh so there are, i think two audiences there's the fleet owners and they're the people operating the business and then there's drivers um you know in our early days uh, uh, uh as you might know like we went and uh drove to truck stops and had like amazon gift cards to, to drivers to tell us about um uh their problems and fuel cards we got interested in this space and wanted to really understand what the pain points are and if if this is even a problem and also, why can't they just use regular credit cards and instead of using these, yeah. you know, um, companies from like the 80s and the 90s uh, technology? Um, uh, so I think after like these couple of weeks, uh, um, we understood the landscape uh, uh, quite well and knew this is the problem we want to tackle. Um, uh, and I think specifically uh, when you when you think about an average truck driver, um, I think uh, there, there's a stat around how most of them are above the age of 50. They're like, that is the uh, our profile. They're not super like um, uh, tech forward or anything like that. So anyway, we, we went to uh, talk to them and uh, we were just very surprised uh, to uh, learn how uh, broken some of these uh, products are. In like 2020, we didn't expect payments to be a problem. Uh, it, like, you know, with Stripe, Square, Rex Ramp, all these companies, we, we weren't expecting to hear that. So um, I think the first thing that really stood out um, to us is around reliability. Um, uh, given these like, uh, you know, fuel cards, uh, built by the ex uh, legacy companies like Vex and Fleetcore in particular, um, are running completely outside Visa and MasterCard. They don't have the same level of acceptance and, uh, sort of network time as, as, you know, we as consumers or other businesses have and take for granted because it just works all the time. Um, I think that was one sort of big eye opener, uh, for us is like, seeing how people have backup cards, backup cash, and I'll have to like, at the end of the day, re reconcile all of this. Um, and I think the other thing that really stood out to us from talking to drivers is how broken their payroll is. Um, you know, uh, uh, most of them are getting paid over paper checks that don't arrive for several days if they're away from home driving. And then they're sort of the biggest audience that also takes out payday loans uh, for that reason. Um, and we thought, you know, the, the technology for doing instant payouts already exists. We can just, you know, build this for, for this this customer base uh, easily. So that then dictated our product roadmap. We started with a fuel card um, built on Visa, except, you know, universal acceptance and 
um, that was our focus on like these small businesses who uh, really cared about reliability and something that just works. Um, and then we sort of built the, the next iteration with like um, uh, instant payroll for drivers. And now we're in a phase where, you know, we've, uh, as we started growing, you know, we have 25,000 plus businesses using our product. Um, we realized that when we go to larger fleets, the pain points are even more visible um, uh, with how they manage their fleets and, and specifically on fuel theft um, and uh, fuel optimization. So those are the uh, areas where we are now starting to innovate um and and seeing strong uh, you know customer adoption um uh, the uh, article i'll talk about kite as one of the customers we work with uh who were an early adopter uh, of our one of the early large customers who use our product who specifically come because of the not just the core reliability but uh to uh you know see the fuel savings from the product yeah right and kite for those who don't know is a car um rental platform uh, i believe they deliver the cars to your door um, for, you to, for you to rent. So it's a, it's a really new, uh, next gen fleet. So, you know, we've talked about that, that you're moving into, you know, away, not away from truckers, but you're expanding beyond truckers at this point and into next generation fleets. Um, so I'm curious, why is, you know, other digital brokers, like if we just kind of bring it back to trucking for, for the sake of this question, other digital brokers that I've spoken to, like Convoy have tried to add fuel cards and instant pay to their booking platforms. But, uh, I, I'm, I have heard that it hasn't been as smooth of a transition as they might have liked. Why can't building out fintech and payments be a side focus? Why does it have to be the whole business? Yeah, I think it's interesting because, um, you know, we expected similarly, like, you know, Convoy or any other company trying to build payments as a sort of a second or side project um, will not go well. I think there's a lot of um, uh, nuances and expertise in, in, in um, building a payments business, both around the core payments side of it, like working with networks, banks, and merchants uh, to, you know, run the payments, but then also on risk and fraud. You know, uh, one of the economics of payments is that if you are uh, not good at risk and fraud, you lose the whole $100. Um, but if you're good at it, uh, uh, or if you, if you just do the business as is, you'll make 1% of that. So you make a dollar. And so for every mistake you make, you know, the, uh, the, it's like sort of that asymmetry. Um, so you have to be really good at, um, both, you know, understanding credit risk, uh, in the segment. Um, and, and, you know, for that reason, Convoy was, um, I believe a prepaid card, um, because this is an industry that, um, uh, does have, you know, a credit risk problem, but then also fraud and understanding, you know, vulnerabilities, uh, when you open up things like wallets and bank accounts and so forth. Um, yeah, I think uh, our, we, we uh, often think about how Amazon, for example, uh, you know, with all the uh, uh, resources they have still, you know, use companies like Stripe to do payments instead of building their own uh, sort of payment side business because they understand how complex uh, payments are at scale uh, and, and need that expertise to get it right. So I haven't seen a ton of examples where uh, a business successfully did payments on the side. Sorry, I'm muted. Um, <laughs> great. Thank you for that. Uh, now, you know, Eric, obviously you're a, a, a people stand, you, you stand for the people, but this obviously has to be a business that you believe in as well. Right. So what is it about, you know, FinTech specifically for, you know, one business, one type of business or, or one sector transportation in this case, what is it that made you back that? Are you not concerned um, you know, in the case of trucking, for example, that it's maybe not future proof for autonomy, which as we all know, is kind of a far away dream, but you know, it could happen. Yeah. yeah. Well, so, so yeah, I think, I think kind of per your, per your comment, you know, I, I, I think Ford and Cruz said that full self-driving would be here by, you know, 2022, 2023, about five, six, seven years ago. So, so I think, uh, as with most things in the hype cycle, uh, when you actually get closer, people realize all of the nuance. Uh, no, so you know, like I, I think, uh, I think our view is is that you know, kind of full trucking autonomy um, is still quite a ways away. I mean, I, I, I think Embark, for example, I, I think they just shut down uh, maybe last week or two weeks ago as well, right? So I think you're you're kind of seeing at this point very much still in the early innings of, of autonomy or full autonomy for sure. And so you know, I think truckers, uh, as with most things, I think kind of humans have a tendency to 
uh, they kind of like uh, develop fear that their jobs are going to be lost tomorrow. When in fact, if you look at technology by and large, uh, you know, it, it actually ends up being paired and, and kind of like enabling humans to make them better, more efficient, whatever at, at their jobs. And so I think we fully expect that to be more of kind of the, the trajectory, um, you know, that, that, that the space will take. I think if you look at A to B specifically and kind of why we were, we're excited about kind of what they're doing, what they're building and, um, you know, I, I think you, obviously, you, you know, transportation and the ins and outs of it, right? The, the reality is, is as a, as a venture firm, um, you know, we're we're looking to invest in in massive categories, right? And and outside of maybe healthcare, uh, you know, there perhaps is no larger category than transportation writ large. And then you look at payments within transportation, right? And I mean, these are these are both massive, massive categories. And so it's it's one of those things where you know very clearly you can see that. Uh, you know, in a kind of a bull case scenario, uh, a company like A to B is a is a multi multi billion dollar company, right? And so I think that's kind of on the highest of levels, right? I think if you actually kind of zoom in and and what's most exciting about A to B specifically, right? I I, I think it's the fact that as you know, Archie just mentioned over the past twenty minutes or so, right? The the financial system for fleets is is clearly broken, right? It's 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 systemic, right? And I mean that that goes everything from mom and pop truckers who are you know kind of still stuck in the in the past of kind of paper invoicing and and, and payroll. Um you know, even to kind of newer folks recently who need, you know, uh, a system that can kind of integrate into their stacks more seamlessly, right? And so, yes, you know, uh, the kind of initial go to market for something like A to B was kind of the the, the fuel card, right? But, uh, you know, Harshita and team have been spending a lot of time building out uh, much more infrastructure to enable you to run the entire stack, right? From the basics of, you know, fuel purchasing, uh, payroll, electronic invoicing, things like that, to kind of like more next generation issues as well, right? So, uh, you know, telematics integrations uh, and, and like kind of custom solutions for mid to larger fleets and everything in between. So I think that, that that's kind of our view is, is um, it's a huge industry uh, within the industry, FinTech itself and kind of payments is a huge industry. Uh, and, and then you look at the solution that they're building, which is running the full stack. It isn't just, you know, yet another card, right? Um, and I think that that resonates quite a bit with us, so. Yeah, absolutely. I think Harshit had said something uh, during a previous call about, you know, only having tapped like a 5% maybe of, of the total addressable market and already, you know, could project for $100 million in revenue. I could be making those numbers up. Harshita, not if I did got it right. <laughs> um, I think 5% would be bigger. Uh, in the US, probably, yeah. I think you're off the ballpark. Yeah, in the US, you in the US, yeah. Um, I do want to, I there's... Yeah, there's definitely a lot of room for A to B to grow. You got some really cool products in the lineup um, to capture even more of the market and more of their the product spend. I'd love to go into that. I encourage other people to look that up and watch this space. I want to get into some of the audience questions, though. We're running out of time, that precious thing. So from Anonymous, thank you, Anonymous. Have you been affected by the SVB collapse? What lessons did you learn? I guess I can go for either of you. I was going to say both ways. You want to go for Archie? Yeah, yeah uh, quite a quite a week. Uh, but uh, so I mean, we we did have exposure. Uh, you know, we had our uh, most for funding uh, there, um, and uh, we tried, unfortunately, to be part of the bank run on Thursday, and you know, uh, move funds to an, another bank account, but our wires didn't clear. Uh, so it was quite a quite a uh, you know uh, a stressful situation, but. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, the impact, uh, now I think is fine for everybody. You know, we, we eventually got the wires cleared on Monday. Uh, we happen to have, uh, you know, because we ha have, you know, funds flow with, you know, different banking and, uh, uh, processing providers. We did, you know, if it hadn't resolved, we would have still been able to make payroll. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was a stressful week. Um, uh, uh, and uh, pretty un un unfortunate uh, for such an important institution uh, uh, to go away like this. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, we we are unimpacted, like I think, like every other depositor at this point. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can take it too. We can move on, whatever you prefer, Rebecca. Yeah. <laughs> I actually, I'd actually like to hear from you about this as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, we. Um... Like we we are very fortunate actually in, in that you know kind of pre as as Archie just said kind of depositors being kind of secure I, I, you know we have a roughly hundred portfolio companies 
um, right now. And, and about 95 of them had gotten most or all of, of all defined most is kind of like, you know, 20%, uh, uh, only having kind of 20%, maybe kind of deposits in, in SVB, uh, prior to kind of things falling out over the weekend. So, um, whether some combination of, you know, great luck or, or fortune or, you know, whatever, uh, um, you know, we were relatively unscathed as well prior again to, to, to the, the government stepping in. But, you know, just from talking with so many friends, I mean, that, that was absolutely not the case, right? For a bank that was banking, you know, 30, 40, 50% of all startups, right? I, I think there were a lot of firms and startups that, uh, that were going to be hit really badly. And even we had, you know, a couple of startups that had tens of millions of dollars, uh, you know, kind of tied up in SVB. So I think, you know, if, if, the deposits, um, you know, weren't fully guaranteed, or if people got quite a meaningful haircut or something like that, it it, it, it could have been quite catastrophic. I think for uh, for for the entire industry. I think fortunately, it feels like for now we've uh, you know kind of can breathe a sigh of relief and have dodged a bullet. But you know, I think uh, I, I think to me this kind of just feels like the starting gun in many ways. Uh, I don't know that you know we're we're going to kind of turn a corner here anytime soon and just the tech slash venture world writ large. So. Mm. Yeah. Dicey, dicey times, I guess we'll have to wait and see what, uh, what develops now. Um, I've got another question from a, a Gus Schultz uh, for Harshita. When did wearing multiple hats as a founder, especially in the infancy of a company become a pain point and were the easiest way to clear these roadblocks, adding new hires slash better delegation? Yeah, I think there there was a time when we we were doing too many things from like review underwriting applications to like building products to doing support. I think at that point where you're multitasking and context switching so much, uh, at that point uh, for sure it became clear we needed people. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, if you if you're context switching too much, uh, is, is I think at that point uh uh needs to hire strong people but i think it's it's uh uh really difficult to find um strong engineers and operators for an early stage startup who uh, are great fits so it takes a long time also uh uh to get them and you have to have a very high bar because the first 10 you know will bring the next uh 100 or so i think it's not my quote i think it comes from some another founder um but i really believe in that and i think we uh we're quite patient uh, uh, with bringing on the early team. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I hope that answers the question. Like when you're like context switching between five, six things in the same day, that's when you need uh, to really hire. Uh, and I think in you know if, if you uh, if for an important problem, if you're able to bring in someone who has tackled it before or has the expertise on it, you know they're going to do a better job uh, for sure, and and you increase your odds of you know succeeding at that. So depending on, you know, whatever runway and funding, the funding in the company, you know, should, should come based on whatever the most two or three most important things that the company has to get right and hiring the right people for that has been our thinking. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Yeah. When you're like, oh, I'm actually spinning like six plates in one day, it's maybe time to, time to drop something. Um, hmm, There are some other questions and I, I wish I could ask them. I'm so sorry to those who have um, sent them in, but I think we need to get into the pitch competition it's time i see matt burns has returned yeah i'm here that, that was great she's a, a fascinating story and eric, eric so knowledgeable i learned a lot uh, rebecca thank you so much for doing this interview you did such a better job than i would have so i really appreciate it thanks so much for having me bye team thanks rebecca. all right well, we're not done with TechCrunch Live yet. We still have one more segment. This is called Pitch Practice. We bring on three companies and they're going to pitch everybody for two minutes. And then we get four minutes of feedback on, on how to improve the pitch. And that's what we're here for. We're trying to help. Um, so this isn't a competition. There's no winners. There's no losers. Basically, everyone wins. So we're going to bring on the first the first founder. First founder is Max, and he's coming from Ant Robotics. Max, I can see you there in the Zoom window. How are you? I'm fine. Yeah. Very good, sir. Well, you have two minutes to present your company starting now. We sell a robot orchestration platform and robots we design to transport parts and materials on factory floors. Our customers are small and medium American manufacturers whose needs cannot be served by warehouse robots available on the market. Unlike to our competitors, our robots can pick pallet without any stationary load and load equipment 
and safely transport pallets through the tight floor environment. Our secret sauce is that we manage to make our robots use regular manual pallet jacks, and as a result, our customer do not have to change anything in their factory layout to start using robots. Our robots help to manage labor shortages and reduce indoor logistic expenses by up to 80%. For all US manufacturers, this is a $60 billion problem and the resulting increase in productivity can amount up to $300 billion of additional revenues to all US manufacturers combined. Two years back, it was a mere idea. Today, we have customers like Verizon and supplier of jet engine parts to Lockheed Martin and Rolls-Royce. We are reaching out to potential funding partners passionate about robotics, industrial automation, and sustainability. Additional $2 million will fund new hires, faster execution of the project in our pipeline, and new customer acquisition. I am Max Antonenko, the founder and CEO of Antrobotics, and previously I was doing my research in academia and serving as a Dean of Software Engineering Chair. And at that time, I believe scientists and engineers are the most important guys in the world. Now, after launching my third startup, I am sure the combination of technical background with entrepreneurial mindset is a broken mixture to succeed in a venture and a world improvement. Very good, Max. Thank you so much. I'll start with the feedback. We can start with the timer. I, I really appreciate that you made a custom background. We don't allow you to bring a deck, but you're the first person I've seen that actually made a custom background and put your product in that custom background. So you didn't cheat. You didn't use a deck. <laughs> I, I wish everyone would do that. So hopefully you start a trend for me, Max. Yeah. All okay. right. Eric, let's go to you. Any feedback? Yeah, it's awesome. Um, yeah, thanks, Max. This is... Uh, uh, I, I think, frankly, you checked off, you know, as you're kind of going throughout your presentation, most of the core things, you know, that that I would want to understand, right? You talked about the problem, the team, the market opportunity, kind of why your product is better. Um, I think for me, maybe the the most helpful thing that I would want to understand or that you could kind of add into the, the pitch next would be, uh, I know it's difficult maybe without pictures per what Matt just said, but just trying to understand what exactly the robots are doing, uh, kind of the customer that they're serving, how they, how just kind of how the product works. Um, I think for me, it's, it's a little bit hard to visualize. I mean, I can visualize a robot going around a warehouse, but, but I don't necessarily know much beyond that, kind of why, how it's valuable to the user, those kinds of things. So I think that would be probably the, the one kind of core piece of feedback that I would have as part of the pitch. But I think the rest of it was actually, you know, you, you hit on many of the other kind of topics or questions that I would be asking. So um, I, I appreciate that. And that, that's probably the core piece for me. I don't know if I want to toss it over to, to you, Harshita. Yeah. Thank you. Harshita? Yeah. Yeah, I think I, I'd echo uh, what uh, Eric said on like being able to visualize and under, and I guess two minutes is not enough to that. I think one question um, for, I'm guessing like you would be approaching people who are, you know, are familiar with the industry a little bit um, and they would likely ask, you know, how does this compare to some of the previous experiments in this space like Kiva systems, which um, that's all I know about warehouse automation, by the way, just this one company, uh, that Amazon <laughs> purchased, uh, to be clear. Uh, so, uh, I'm curious, like, uh, how, how that compares, maybe in a longer pitch, you can talk about like, you know, this is a technology Kiva built, this is the technology we built, you know, anyone who's not Amazon now gets access to this. But I think that like, it was a very clear one-liner that I can imagine, um, because Amazon has, you know, everything others don't have what they have, and this is the value it provides. Um, that would have really clicked if that was if that is the case. I don't know if that is the case. Uh, let, let me interpret what what both these guests just both said to you, uh, Max. That that okay. you're you came across as an expert, and, and we trust you at this point. We just want to know more about your product, and that's a limitation of of the constraints I put on you. So your pitch was very good. You came across authoritative. You you understand it, and there was passion behind your voice. So I, I think you got everything going for you. Thank you, thank you, Matt. Uh, thank you, Roland. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Max. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Max. Best of luck to you. Yeah. All right. Very good. Well, we have two more. Next, we have Zach. Zach is coming to us from Chauffeur. And I'm Zach, I see you in the Zoom. There you are. All right. 
All righty, guys. Uh, how, how, how are you? I'm good. How are you guys doing today? Very good. Thanks. Well, you have two minutes to present starting now. Awesome. Hey, everyone. I'm Zach Castaneda, co-founder and CEO of Chauffeur. Chauffeur is the easiest way to reserve private chauffeur transportation, such as party buses, limos, shuttles, SUVs, or sedans. Chauffeur is the first and only Airbnb-like marketplace for this specific industry that caters to both customers and chauffeurs, who we call operators. Currently, the customer reservation experience is absolutely terrible. From having to call a bunch of operators for quotes to being asked to pay with unsecured payment methods like Zelle, Venmo, et cetera. And not to mention the lack of communication once you, after you pay. You're always left wondering if the vehicle is actually going to show up. That all changes with Chauffeur as we provide customers a dedicated marketplace that utilizes modern day tech, just like Airbnb. On the other side of our marketplace, we have our operators who also have bad user experiences. They're, using their, they're managing their business with paper calendars, Excel spreadsheets, or even worse, outdated tech that is expensive and doesn't even work most of the time. Chauffeur provides these guys with a simple to one business management software that automates their entire business for them. From reservations, drivers, payments, communications, and other day-to-day -day tasks, Chauffeur is a game changer for these guys, and they're absolutely loving it. Chauffeur launched, um, that said, the Chauffeur team consists of myself and my co-founder CTO, as well as two other team members who focus on UI UX and mobile app development. We launched Chauffeur in December of 2022, and we are currently live in 12 US states, as well as Cabo San Lucas, Mexico. One really cool indicator for us is that our net promoter score is a perfect 100 out of 100 right now. And that tells us that customers love what we're building. They're going to come back for more. And most importantly, they're going to tell their, fam their family and friends about Chauffeur. We are currently raising a $2 million seed round at a, post, at a $15 million post that will allow us to accelerate our growth tremendously. That said, Chauffeur is at a really exciting time. So join us as we revolutionize the $74 billion industry, one reservation at a time. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks, Zach. Hershita, you know a little bit about this. Yeah, Let's start with you. Yeah, you know, we went through this exact problem, you know, when we were working on uh, uh, buses, you know, we, it, it was so difficult to find out, A, who are the companies in, in this geography, and then we would, like, call them all up, and they'd be like, you know, can you write a check? Uh, so it was, like, it was very difficult to, like, even set up any form of recurring payments or recurring reservation, because, you know, we were trying to basically work with these small business bus operators, um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, small and big ones, like, We Drive You is a big one, and things, folks like that, and then try to, like, uh, mash them to to riders. Uh, so I remember that's when I uh, uh, also right we thought like payments and transportation generally uh, th don't seem to be um, a very organized. I think uh, the you, you said I guess the only question I would have um, is is seventy four billion the, the TAM like are is everybody sort of uh, using the marketplace or are these some of these are long term contracts? Uh, that's my main question. Is like. Who is the target audience uh, hmm. for this? Uh, that is not what I um, I think understood, uh, and maybe that's my bad. But like, like I can see like what we were trying to do would be a clear uh, customer. Um, but I can imagine, you know, office like corporate reasons they might want to book a party bus or like a limousine and things like that. Um, uh, that is one customer base I can think of. Um, but is does is that the entire TAM sort of thing? Like, um, does everybody use the marketplace, or do some of them have long term contract and and if, if, uh, what, who is the customer essentially? Yeah. Yeah. Restating the TAM sometimes, especially when you, when you go for the whole TAM, sometimes it's better to, to state both the TAM and then the serviceable market that, that you're actually trying to get at the first step. Gotcha. You, you got savvy people. All right, Eric, <laughs> over to you. Can I respond or no, this is just, this is just the, uh, you know, critique, right? This yeah, absolutely. Go for it. I mean, maybe you'll get money from it. I don't have any money from you, but Eric does. <laughs> yeah. Um, hey Zach. Yeah, I, I was gonna say. You know, I, I think. Um, uh, I think yeah, pr pretty solid pitch for the most part. My my kind of like four question marks, skepticisms, feedback, whatever. Uh, I, I think you know one one would be you know my my visceral reaction uh, to the to the first part of the actual marketplace side, right? Is thinking ah like isn't this how Uber started, right? Isn't this what Uber did, right? Uh, they started with black cars, right? They started with kind of things like this that are a little bit disorganized, uh, very um, uh, uh, kind of like. Uh, I can't think of the right word right now. Like, uh, you know, fragmented is the right word. That's it. Like yep. super fragmented, right? Um, yep. and, and these, you know, kind of have proven themselves over time kind of like very hard to kind of aggregate, centralize. So, so that's, you know, one piece of the puzzle, right? But then you also mentioned that you're building software for these folks, right? And so in, in my mind, I was thinking, okay, well, th these are actually 
potentially just two different businesses full stop, right? And 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 you, you might be better served in the early days, uh, just focusing all of your efforts on one of them and seeing which what can happen with that, right? So uh, either trying to build up the marketplace component of it for, for you know, uh, uh, buses or black cars or whatever it might be, or the other element of it being, hey, you know, we're just going to try to build a, a kind of vertical SaaS tool for these kinds of companies. And, and that uh, alone could be a, huge business. I mean, you take a look at like, like Squire is one that's top of mind that basically does this for barbershops, right? Some multi hundred million dollar company just building vertical SaaS for barbershops, right? So, uh, you know, if, if you just maybe said, hey, we're just going to build vertical SaaS for limo companies or buses or whatever, like that alone could be a huge opportunity. And so maybe, you know, uh, you know, uh, consider, you know, not spreading yourself too thin in the early days when you're trying to figure out kind of a true go to market and pick one, go deep on that, and then kind of you know, see which which one you get the most customer love from. So that that would kind of be my my high level feedback. So wow. appreciate it. Thank you advice. so much. Yeah, thank you guys very much. All right, Zach, keep in touch. We'll do. Thanks so much. All right, we got one more, and this one I have to say was picked about forty five minutes ago. So this is our wild card for this one. So this is right from the audience. So we have Harry. Harry is coming to us from I don't know how to say the company name. Harry, are you there? I can see you in Zoom. You got to turn your camera and your mic on. And then we'll get you in here. If I could do it for you, I would, but I can't. So I'm going to give you an extra second or two here. And then I got to go on. Okay, mic's on. We're halfway there. Get your camera. Oh, sorry. I'm just talking to me, right? So let me. No worries. Yeah, give me a second. Yes. If you would like to apply for pitch practice, I, I, I would like that. I would love to have more people here. There's a form online and all of our registration emails. And then we also pick one from the audience every week too. So please do that. All right. So we're going to give Harry a couple more seconds here. I'm going to drop his URL into the hop in window. Can you see me? Yeah, not really. Your camera's on. Okay. Okay, Harry, I'm I'm gonna have to drop you All here, right. but we can um, have you back next week if you'd like. Okay. Let me All get right. We'll, kind of we'll, we'll do that. We'll be in touch. All right. Well, that's fun. Yeah. I really wanted to do this one too because guess what it is? It is Uber for busing. <laughs> what an expert. <laughs> Um, and it was picked a wild, a wild card too. So it was very good. So there's the link. I put it in hop in and I put it in zoom. So, so everyone has access to it, but I guess that concludes this week's tech crunch live. So Eric or Sheeta, thank you so much for a great episode. This has been a lot of fun. I learned a lot more about trucking than I knew than I knew before. So until next week, we'll talk to you guys later. Thanks for having me.